I will enter into that conversation regarding Victorian social mores and the status of vivisection uh, as a procedure that Wells was responding to and trying to grapple with in his presentation of the famed vivisectionist, quote unquote, Dr. Moreau. In other words, how people were viewing vivisection and the kinds of broad social developments around vivisection and this scientific technique uh, that we see in Wells' era. If you click on this link to archive.org, you'll find a link to a book that was published in England in 1873, Handbook for the Physiological Laboratory. This work was a translation of continental works that had been published years earlier that introduced many of the practices of contemporary science and vivisection in particular from the continent. Now, Vivisection was a practice that was going on in England prior to the publication of this handbook, but um, it brought to public consciousness the status of vivisection and its impact on scientific research and development. This book, Handbook for the Physiological Laboratory, included both best practices and a description of vivisectionist techniques that were more advanced from the continent, and also the fruits of that research that have been conducted through vivisection. What I have in the next series of slides that we'll transition to and then return to this slide are a series of excerpts from that handbook for the physiological laboratory. So you'll get a sense of the material that was being produced. So here you see various different illustrations of organelles and blood vessels structures in the throat and the eye of animals that have been vivisected, detailed diagrams and breakdowns, the structure of various different muscle and blood systems, a uh, flaying open of the cheek in order of a hog in order to illustrate the inner workings. But you also have depictions and uh, procedures for the construction of materials and tools that could be used in the vivisectionist laboratory. A cross section of the eye that was partially produced through the process of vivisection so they could see the interconnections between the various different parts of the eye and also um, examine the animal before any kind of decay or degradation had taken place. Now, as we noted, H.G. Wells was a trained biologist based on his education and his science journalism. So he took his education in the sciences and unified that with his interests in literature and writing in order to enter into science journalism through the 1890s. As a result, he was able to understand sociological concerns and scientific concerns regarding the development of these techniques. After all, he could now look at this both from the public perception that he was helping to shape through his journal articles and from the scientist's perspective that he could understand because of his education and his training. Dr. Moreau, as a character in this work, is largely constructed as a an embodiment and a response to the fears that Wells recognized in the population regarding vivisectionists and their practices. Englishmen who were exposed to vivisection and particularly to this uh, handbook for the physiological laboratory largely viewed vivisection and the techniques described therein as a form of moral contagion to the country. They looked at this handbook that described the procedures from nations on the continent and looked at it through a kind of xenophobic lens, believing that the presumptions, the beliefs, and the immorality of these other nations were entering into Great Britain and corrupting it. So something about the moral fiber of Great Britain was being deteriorated and corrupted through the filtration of foreign practices and ideas. And that, in addition to the moral outrage surrounding the procedures themselves, built on each other and helped to lead to the formation of several anti-vivisectionist societies. So as an example of these, the Victoria Street Society, later uh, named the National Anti-Vivisection Society in 1897, formed in 1875 
these groups would protest the operations of vivisections and try to subvert their work and help to move the government in order to put strict restrictions on the vivisectionist practice and uh, potentially to ensure that there was proper oversight or even to ban the procedures and practices outright. Popular media journals like The Spectator and works that were devoted more explicitly towards activism, like the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, imposed, implemented certain campaigns against the techniques of vivisectionists. As a result of their efforts and the way in which public perception was shaped by their campaigns, many people had in mind a vision of the mad scientist or the mad vivisectionist when they thought of the procedures. So they weren't dealing necessarily with the techniques themselves, but with the image that had been constructed for them. However, vivisectionists themselves oftentimes did themselves no favors. In fact, quite the opposite. They could compromise their own cause. For instance, when he was brought before a royal commission, a kind of inquiry into the processes and procedures of vivisectionists, the famed vivisectionist Emmanuel Klein, originally from Australia, said in 1875 that he was utterly indifferent to animal pain, explaining that he almost never used anesthesia. So his in being inured against any sensibility regarding pain, his being utterly incapable of any form of empathy for the screams and the, the blood and pain and suffering that is actually a part of vivisection, helped to turn public sentiment against him. So when we think to the Moreau horrors described by Prendrick in, from the journals that he's discussing, we have a direct parallel to Wells' experiences. And this absolute aloof perspective on the pain of creatures in both Emmanuel Klein's perspective and that of other real life vivisectionists is meant to be an inspiration or is an inspiration for Dr. Moreau's. On the side of the scientists, there was a great deal of concern that the nation would be left behind in the pursuit of scientific knowledge as a result of public outcry and displaced or misplaced moral sentiment. They believed that these processes, and they argued that these practices, were necessary for scientists within Great Britain or England to keep pace with their continental rivals or continental contemporaries. In 1875, Francis Powers Cobb, a humanitarian, started one of the uh, world's first anti-vivisectionist organizations in an attempt to combat this quote-unquote moral contagion. When it was formed in December of 1875, there were about 300 experiments performed on animals each year. Public opposition to these practices led to the, the commission of a royal inquest into vivisection. This inquiry, this royal first royal commission on vivisection in July of 1875 that produced its findings in January of 1876 recommended that legislation be put in place to control vivisection. So at this point, the anti-vivisectionist communities had actually won some important gains in the attempt to ensure that vivisection as a practice was well regulated. The Cruelty to Animals Act that was published in 1876 regulated vivisection and at the same time provided anonymity and secrecy to vivisectors and their laboratories. So there was essentially no public accountability, even though guidelines were put in place for vivisectionists. The location of these laboratories was thus kept secret. So what we have here is a parallel to what's going on behind closed doors, the locked doors of Dr. Moreau's compound. No access to these laboratories was granted even to members of parliament, the media, public, or local authorities. As a result, vivisection actually flourished under these new regulations because there was no real oversight to it. So the secrecy that we see in this novella and the fact that, after all, Moreau's laboratory is described within the novella as a Bluebeard's chamber indicates how this prevailing secrecy surrounding vivisection and public perception of it as a result are paralleled in the novella. The story of Bluebeard 
appears in chapter 12, The Locked Door. So there's, again, this parallelism between the locked door, the secrecy, the hidden vivisectionist laboratory, and what is going on on Dr. Moreau's island. Dr. Moreau references Bluebeard as a description of his own environment, of his own laboratory. I'll explain how this reference frames vivisection in just a moment, but the quotation itself. That's it, said the elder man promptly, looking at Montgomery, and all three of us went towards the enclosure. I'm sorry to make a mystery, Mr. Prendick, but you'll remember you're uninvited. Our little establishment here contains a secret or so. Is a kind of Bluebeard's chamber, in fact. Nothing very dreadful, really, to a sane man. But just now, as we don't know you, decidedly, said I, I should be a fool to take offense at any want of confidence. So I can't blame you for not trusting me, of course, because I'm a stranger to you. I would do the same. Dr. Moreau suggests that anyone who objects to the procedures and practices that are taking place in his Bluebeard's chamber, inside that locked room where he's vivisecting the puma, must be insane, must be mad. Only a fool or a madman would object to this entirely rational, coolly logical, and necessary scientific procedure. Now, Bluebeard's story, in order to understand the illusion that H.G. Wells is presenting to us here, the story of Bluebeard, or at least one variation of that legend, is as follows. Bluebeard is a nobleman who tries to persuade Fatima, the youngest child of the local lord with several daughters and sons, to marry him. His spectacular household, lavish gifts, wonderful works of art, elaborate carriages, and gentlemanly manners win her to him, despite his poor reputation. So people don't really trust him, they don't like him. However, because he's rich, and because he is well behaved, well mannered, polite, she accepts his offer to marry him. She has given keys to all the rooms inside of his chateau or his home, even to one small chamber that she's forbidden to enter. So this is the Bluebeard's chamber parallel or illusion that Dr. Moreau makes. As soon as Bluebeard leaves on business, her visiting sister convinces her to satisfy her curiosity by opening the chamber and unveiling its contents. When she enters the room, she finds its floor awash with blood. Bluebeard's former wives hang lifeless upon the walls. The key clatters to the floor, landing in the pool of blood that suffuses the ground or that covers the ground. Horrified, she flees the room, locking the door behind her. But as if by magic, the blood and the stains cannot be washed away from the key. Bluebeard returns unexpectedly and tries to enter his forbidden chamber. On seeing the blood-stained key, he assaults his wife and her sister with the intent of killing them. Both women flee to the top of a tower in Bluebeard's chateau, with the man roaring for their blood from below. And the climax of the tale is punctuated by Fatima's repeated plea, Anne, Sister Anne, do you see anyone coming? They await the sight of their brothers who are expected to visit that day. And after many tense moments, just as Bluebeard is poised to lop off his wife's head, their brothers arrive to dispatch Bluebeard. So what we have here on Moreau's part is an injunction against any possible curiosity or actions undertaken in curiosity. It is in a sense, a threat and a warning. But it also frames the events that transpire behind that locked door. It's paralleled with the slaughter of Bluebeard's former wives and the test of trustworthiness that he gives to Fatima. Interactive class, we're going to be focusing on Moreau's self-defense and his explanation of his scientific experiments. If you have questions about the plot here or about any of the content of these video lectures, please reach out to contact me. I would be happy to set up a meeting with you in order to um, discuss any issues that you might have.